And good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings. Now, quick reminder, because this is holiday week, because this is Christmas week, and I know Christmas is on Sunday, but, you know, like I told you a couple of weeks ago, uh, when when the holiday season came, when Christmas week came, I was going to be taking a little bit of time off. Got some family things to do and to enjoy, so we're going to do exactly that. So, I'll, I will only have videos through tomorrow this week, and again, tomorrow I'm going to break from our study of the Olivet Discourse, and I'm going to be answering some of the objections that have been lodged against my brand new book, Temple to Tell Us. Uh, there are ba basically four, uh, when, when you break them all down, the, there are basically four major objections to this book that have been lodged. And so I, I want to pay attention to those. I want to give you that information. And <clears throat> pardon me. You know, those of you who have been following uh, that on YouTube already know what the objections are. But there are probably many of you who have not followed that, especially on Facebook. And so I'm going to be pro providing that information for you. Okay? Thank you again for joining me for this morning's Morning Musings. By the way, if I forget to do it in the morning, Merry Christmas to you. I hope you and your family have a fantastic weekend. You know, somebody asked me the other day, uh, well, are you all set for Christmas? Uh, well, I haven't bought a thing, okay? I don't do Christmas shopping. Not because I don't believe in Christmas. I don't believe it's Jesus' birthday, but I love the holiday season. I love the camaraderie. I love the fellowship. I, I love the time off. <laughs> uh, although I work constantly during the time off. <clears throat> you know, believe it or not, I'm writing another book right now. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, I, I love the time of year. I'm not a Christmas shopper. My wife's not a great Christmas shopper. Now, she buys for the grandkids, naturally, and all that kind of stuff. But hey, you know, it is what it is. So back to our discussion of the Olivet Discourse. Now, remember, remember, folks, this is this is so critical. Matthew 25, 31 and following, the very last of Jesus' disc, uh, discourses in the Olivet Discourse is taken from a variety of Old Testament prophecies, to be sure. I mean, we could argue, I don't know of anyone that would really disagree with it, we could argue that Matthew 25, 31 and following is Jesus' prediction of the coming of new heaven and new earth. Well, is that terminology found in Matthew 25, 31 and following? No. But it's his second coming, and his second coming is to bring in the new creation. See, so this, this is another example of the, of the negative fallacy being refuted. You know, person after person after person is posted to me. One person told me, as I read the comment just this morning, you have to find the specific statement about such and such, this or that and the other. No. <laughs> Look, folks, as I've said many, many times, if the context teaches a doctrine, then the specific terminology of that doctrine doesn't have to be present. Context is what determines. Don't fall into that logical fallacy trap, i.e., again, negative fallacy, of saying, Preston, you've got to produce this specific phrase or your doctrine is false. Once again, no, I don't. You know, I dare say most of the folks who make that objection believe in the Trinity. Hmm. But they can't find that specific word or term in all the Bible. And generally speaking, when you point that out, well, the doctrine's there. Thank you very much. That's exactly what I'm teaching. Okay, so yesterday I did the connection connected all the dots between Isaiah 2 through 4, Luke 23, 28 to 31, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, Revelation 6, and Revelation chapter 16. Now, the reason I did that is because Revelation chapter 6, 12 and following, okay, predicts the coming of the last days, day of the Lord, by citing verbatim Isaiah chapter 2, 19 to 21, which, remember, 
Jesus quoted to predict the impending destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Got to remind you of the hermeneutical question. This is important. Since Jesus quoted verbatim from Isaiah 2, 19 to 21, and applied it to the impending destruction of Jerusalem, since Paul quoted verbatim from Isaiah 2, 19 to 21, anticipating its fulfillment in the lifetime of the Thessalonians, since John in Revelation, actually the angel, quotes verbatim from Isaiah 2, 19 to 21, the very verses that Jesus applied to AD 70, Here's the hermeneutical question one more time. What is the hermeneutical justification for saying, well, yeah, that's what Jesus applied it to, but, <clears throat> but Paul and John are applying it to different situations, different days of the Lord at radically different and disparate times. When... <clears throat> Uh, that is to say, that hermeneutical question is all the more powerful when Isaiah 2 to 4 is about the coming of the Lord for the vindication of the martyrs. Jesus' application of that in Luke 23 is about the coming day of the Lord in vindication of his suffering. Paul's citation of that text is about the coming vindication of the suffering of the Thessalonian martyrs. And Revelation is citing those same verses in the promise of the coming imminent vindication of the martyrs at the last day's day of the Lord. What is the hermeneutical justification for, for taking Jehoiakim's pen knife and slashing and slashing and slashing, cutting these passages up and say, oh, well, okay, this applied there, uh, but this doesn't, and this applies over here. Folks, we don't have a right to do that. Okay, so as I pointed out yesterday, Revelation chapter 16, 6 and following, predicted the coming of the great day of God's wrath. For what? To vindicate the suffering of the martyrs of Revelation chapter 6. Now, this proves beyond a shadow of a doubt, ladies and gentlemen, that the book of Revelation is not a sequential chronological narrative. It is recapitulation. It gives us the same story, the same narrative repeated over and over from different perspectives with different details, but never truly contradictory details. And thus, once again, what do we find? The promise of the coming of the great day of God's wrath, Revelation 6, in fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 2, 19 to 21. Revelation 16, the coming of the great day of God's wrath and vindication of the martyrs in response to their prayer of Revelation chapter 6. Now look, if you're going to say that Revelation is chronologically sequential, then you got to explain this. In Revelation 6, at the great day of the Lord, creation is destroyed. In Revelation chapter 16, at this coming of the great day of God's wrath, what happens? Creation is destroyed. So if you're going to argue that Revelation 6 is one event in time, and Revelation chapter 16 is a different event taking place at a different period of time, then you are positing two separate destructions of creation. Oh, and by the way, you're doing so in this proposed seven-year tribulation period that dispensationalism claims is being discussed in Revelation 6 through 19. So in this so-called seven-year tribulation, and by the way, it's actually and technically only three and a half years because the first three years, three and a half years in the dispensational paradigm is a time of peace. It's not the coming of the Lord. 
The saints are not created in this great tribulation period until the man of sin violates the covenant and begins to persecute the Christians. So in a three and a half year period of time, according to the dispensational paradigm and view of Revelation, Revelation 6, destruction of creation. Revelation 16, destruction of creation at the great day of God's wrath. Is that even tenable? That doesn't even make good... Please forgive me for my bluntness. That doesn't even make good nonsense. Destruction, two separate distinct, distinct destructions of creation in a three and a half year period? Oh, wait a minute. Wouldn't that suggest that from the destruction of the creation in Revelation chapter 6, 12 and following, <clears throat> that you have to have a new heaven and new earth? in order for that creation, you know, the destruction of creation of Revelation 16 be, to be destroyed. But wait a minute. Revelation only gives us one description of one new heaven and new earth. Hmm. And that's not all that can be said on this conundrum. If you posit the cons chronological sequential narrative in the book of Revelation. It just simply does not work. On my website, I have a video lesson on the end of the millennium and the concept, the, the motif of the destruction of creation. Let me recommend that you go there and watch that video. Uh, you, you can, you know, you can download it. You can watch it. Okay, now then, so Revelation chapter 16 is about the time of the vindication of the martyrs. Now, let me repeat. The Old Testament identified Jerusalem as the city that killed the prophets. Jesus identified Jerusalem <clears throat> as the city that killed the prophets sent to her. Now, watch this very quickly, running out of time. Let me, let me drive this home. Matthew chapter 21, the parable of the vineyard. A master had a vineyard. He let it out to vineyard workers. The time of the harvest came. He sent his servants, you know, the prophets, to gather the harvest. The vineyard workers beat them, mistreated them. He sent his son. They killed him. Do you suppose this has something to do with the sending of the prophets to Jerusalem? Yeah. So Jesus posed the question, to the Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, and Jews standing around, what will the master of the vineyard do when he comes? You see, this is coming of the Lord. And the Pharisees responded, he will utterly destroy those wicked husbandmen. <laughs> Out of their own mouth. Well, folks, do you suppose this is talking about the city that killed the prophets of Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 16, but we're not done. Revelation chapter, I'm sorry, Matthew, <coughs> Matthew chapter 22, a certain nobleman made a great feast, a great wedding feast for his son. And he sent out his servants to call those who had been invited, saying, all things are ready, come to the feast. But those who had been invited began to meet, uh, mistreat them, to treat them spitefully, and even to slay them. The master of the, uh, of the wedding sent out his army. He was angry. Sent out, his, <coughs> sent out his armies to destroy those wicked men and burnt their city. Who do you suppose those are who sent out, who were sent out to declare, "All things are ready. Come to the feast." It's the prophets. Now, one could argue here, these are the New, New Testament prophets, and I don't have a problem with that because there is an, actually an organic unity between the Old Testament prophets and New, but there is a temporal disconnect. But here's the point. Who was it that Jesus was describing as being guilty of killing the prophets? Those sent to them. Matthew chapter 23. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you together as a mother hen gathers her chicks, gathered you under my wings as a mother hen, a chick, mother hen, 
uh, gathers her chicks, but you would not. Why? Well, because, what, what were they doing? Thou that killest the prophets. Not possible that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Stephen in the temple. Which of the prophets have you not slain? Folks, how in the world do we come to Revelation and the indictment, the accusation against Babylon is she killed the prophets? How do we divorce that from the Old Testament testimony? How do we divorce that from Matthew 21? How do we divorce that from Matthew chapter 22? How do we divorce that from Matthew chapter 23? How do we divorce that from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul said the Jews had killed the prophets? And all of a sudden we come to Revelation and we say, oh, well, yeah, but Babylon doesn't have anything to do with any of that because Babylon's not really a specific city. That is utter, complete nonsense. And again, you just have to forgive me for being so blunt. But when people literally are willing to go to any extent to avoid the truth of God's word, you know, sometimes we just have to say things pretty clearly. I don't mean to be ugly, but it's important to see these truths. And when you pose these challenges to those who <clears throat> try to identify Babylon and Revelation as all cities but no city, guess what? You get no answer whatsoever. Hey, go to my website, donkpreston.com. There's an article that I just posted there last week entitled, A Response to Sam Frost Article, The Great City is all cities, but no city. Uh, you need to go. You need to go check that article out. Okay. All right. Hey, thanks so much for joining me on this morning's morning musings. Don't forget, in the morning, I'm going to respond to some objections to my brand new book, Temple to Tell Us. You don't want to miss it. So I'll see you there.